Praise the Lord. Glad that you're able to come tonight. I'm, I'd like to thank Pastor before we get started here. Just like to thank God and the Pastor here for letting me uh, be in the pulpit tonight. Uh, before I preach, though, kind of helps my nerves a little bit if we sing first. So we're going to go ahead and sing a song on the solid rock.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to do something a little different with my text tonight. So before I get started, I'm just going to tell you the title. I have a lengthy text tonight, so I'll tell you the title, and we'll pray, and then I'll let you be seated, and then I'll go ahead and start tonight. So my title tonight is just basically this, Miracle in the Storm. If we could pray over this message tonight. God, I thank you, Lord, for all that you do, Jesus. Lord, I thank you for the spirit we feel in this place tonight, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that, you, Lord, that I'm able to minister, Lord. Lord, that I'm able to say, Lord, what you want me to say, God. And, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do tonight, God. We praise your name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> got to get used to saying that. Thank you for my fiance helping me out. I got to get used to doing that. <laughs> Not used to that. It's only been about a month and a half. <laughs> In Matthew 14 and 22, it says, Straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get on into a ship and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So Jesus had just got done <clears throat> doing all these types of miracles, healings, and all this. And he said, we're going to go across let's all get in the boat, we're going to go across. And he had sent the multitudes away and went up to a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, <clears throat> he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is the Spirit. And they cried out in fear. I know if I was... And this is the only thing I have to compare it with. But if I was on a real foot and I seen someone coming walking across, I would either say either they know where every stump is or I am scared right now and I'm about to get out of here. <laughs> but it says when the disciples saw him, they had fear. But straightway Jesus spoke to them saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. So they knew who he was so he said, It is I. He didn't say, I'm Jesus. I'm, hey, I just can't walk across. He said, I, It is I. And they knew who he was. Said, and Peter answered and said, unto, <clears throat> and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. So Peter's feeling brave right now. He's like, if it's you, just let me walk across to you on this water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked onto the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Yeah. <clears throat> and, when they, <clears throat> and when they were coming to the ship, the wind ceased. Yeah. Then they were in the ship and came worshiping him, saying, Of a truth thou art the Son of God. So the first thing that I noticed in that verse whenever I was reading it and studying was as soon as they got into the boat, the wind stopped. Last time that I was in a storm on water, it wasn't the flattest surface to have a boat on. So I'm wondering, how are they standing on this water if there's waves, you've got a storm happening? How is this possible that there's a spot that they're literally able to stand on where waves aren't hitting them? There's got to be some way that God is working this out. We sit and wonder, why did Peter even say this why did he say if it's you let me walk on the water why did he jump out to see if he could walk on the water well there was another time that I believe Peter was there with them this is when Jesus was asleep on the boat during the storm it said that he took his disciples with him and they were going across the sea this is just a few verses ahead or a few verses before <clears throat> and he took his disciples with him and they went on the sea, and they all got scared because a storm came, and he was asleep in the bottom of the boat. In Matthew 8 and 23, it says, When he entered into the ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves. But he was asleep. I don't know how he slept through it, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. Basically, they're saying, save us or we're going to die here. This is a bad storm. you got to wake up, Jesus. You can't be asleep when this is happening. And he said unto them, why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? <clears throat> then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So I believe, it says, the men were marveled, saying, what manner of this 
<clears throat> man is this, that the, even the winds and the sea obey him. Yeah. See, that's why I think Peter was so brave just a few chapters later to say, God, let me walk on the water. If it's you, let me walk out there with you. I, I don't want to wait for you to come to me. I want to go meet you. I want to go and get the experience and the miracle of being able to do what no other human was able to do. If you look back, I don't see anyone else really walking on water like that to go meet Jesus. Peter was the only man that got to walk on water to go meet Jesus like that. Because he believed, because he knew this man is powerful. i seen him stop winds. i seen him stop a storm. I know he can let me walk across this water. In the midst of that storm, that's when Peter got his miracle. <clears throat> he realized that then, when the wind and sea obeyed him, that God had all control. If you look through the Bible, Peter went through a lot of storms. Peter later in the Bible got mad because of a Roman soldier was taking Jesus. And he cut a man's ear off with a sword. You know, if it had been me, I would have ran. So, oh my goodness, Peter went crazy. He's got a sword. He cut a man's ear off. I'm out of here. <laughs> but Jesus bends down, picks up this man's ear, and heals his ear. Puts it back on the side of his head. In the midst of that storm, in the midst of that problem, God stopped and said, there's still going to be a miracle done right now. No matter what situation Peter found himself in, God always made a miracle for him. He always had a reason he always had a thing that he would do in the midst of the storms that Peter was in. Peter was a fisherman, not a soldier. <clears throat> he was the brother of Andrew, another of Jesus' disciples. I mean, what was Peter thinking when he was surrounded by a bunch of soldiers to say he's going to draw a sword and to assault one of these people? I mean, he's a fisherman. What was he thinking? But again, like I said, Peter was going through a storm. He knew if the Roman soldiers got Jesus that his savior of the world would soon die. Yeah. So he was faced with a decision, and he made, let's just say he made a bad decision, but God made it better at the time. I mean, it's easy to sit back and say, why did Peter do that? Why did he choose that route? Why did he, and it's easy to sit back and criticize whenever we're not in his shoes. <clears throat> when I was studying for this, I came across a story I thought was pretty funny. It's, uh, old Pete had a knack for catching fish. <clears throat> Every weekend, Old Pete went fishing and returned with dozens of fish. Nobody knew how he did it. When another fisherman, when other fishermen were un unable to land more than three or four, Old Pete always came back with stringer after stringer full of fish. Curious, the fish and game warden decided to investigate. He followed Old Pete out to the lake, and when he launched his boat at the dock, <clears throat> the warden asked if he could ride along and observe. And sure, said Pete. He said, sure, hop in. Come on with me. Old Pete started up his motor, and when they arrived to an obscure, like just far out part of the lake, Pete stopped the boat, and the warden sat back and started to watch. Reach, reaching into a box, Pete pulled out a stick of dynamite and lit it. He tossed it in the water, and after the explosion, dead fish started rising to the surface. <laughs> Old Pete took out a net and started scooping them up. Wait a minute, said the warden. What, what are you doing? He said, you can't do that. I'll put you in jail, buddy. You'll be paying a high fine. You'll be paying every high fine in the book that I can find. <laughs> so you'll never fish again. Old Pete calmly put down his net, picked up a second stick of dynamite, lit it, and tossed it in the warden's lap. He said, so you're going to sit there criticizing me all day, or are you going to fish? <laughs> I'm pretty sure the game warden threw it. <laughs> But the game warden was quickly transformed from a passive observer to, shall we say, an enthusiastic participant. I mean, it's always easy to criticize somebody when they're going through the storm and you're not. We always hear that saying, well, if you walked a mile in somebody else's shoes, you would see why they are the way they are. Well, that's the same way. If you were going through the same storms as someone else, would you make the same decisions? Would the same things cross your path that cross their path? We don't know. Decisions aren't nearly as neat and as clear when you're the one that's in the tough place. I mean, it's easy to criticize when it's not your storm. It's, the important thing is not to, criticize for so, not to criticize someone that's in the storm. Just pray for them that they get through it. Whenever you see that somebody is going through a difficult time, 
That's when we stop and pray. We don't stop and criticize. We stop and pray. <clears throat> when, you're in when you're in a storm, it's important to go back to the foundation. We always, we always sang that song in Sunday school about the wise man who built his house upon a rock. And you talk about the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. You know, storms may come, but your foundation has to be strong. That's why we sung that song tonight. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Everything else is just sinking sand. Why, why should I put my house on something that I know is not going to be firm? Why am I going to build my life on something that I know is not going to be there in 10 years? Why am I going to put all of my time into something that I know is not going to help and save me eternally? Why would I do that when I have Christ a solid rock, when I have Jesus at my side? <clears throat> Psalms 1 and 1, it says, Blessed is the man who, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. <clears throat> but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That bringeth forth fruit, his fruit in his season. His leaf also, also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You know, I, I like that verse just for the fact of, if you've ever seen a tree by a stream, a tree that's by maybe a river, that's an unlimited supply of water. That tree can, it can thrive and do the best it possibly can because there's an unlimited supply of water right at its roots going by. And could you imagine how strong a tree like that would be compared to maybe one that's not around water? Very few, very few rain, very few rainstorms come through. They say that whenever a tree gets plenty of water and whenever it goes through storms, that's when it's the strongest it could be. If a tree never faced a storm, and I remember I taught this in a youth class, I guess about eight or ten years ago. Wow, it makes me feel old now. <laughs> I remember though, I taught it at, and I did some research on an oak tree. They said if an oak tree never seen a storm, it was more likely that whenever a storm came through, it would knock it down the first time. But if it, as a young tree, went through storms, and as it grew and grew, its roots would sink deeper into the soil, and firmly rooting it and grounding it to where it would not move, where it would not leave its spot. <clears throat> if a tree never faced that, its roots would be on the top of the soil. It wouldn't go deeper. It wouldn't have that firm foundation like it does. In Matthew 7 and 24, it says, Whos Therefore, whosoever heareth these things, sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto the wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened to the foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. It's not just going to fall if you, put your, if you put your thoughts and your mind and your beliefs and everything onto something that's not the rock. If you don't put your, if you don't put your life towards Jesus, if you don't work on building that foundation, that fall's going to hurt. It's not going to be just an easy fall. It's going to be a, <clears throat> it's going to be a fall that's going to hurt. It, it said, and great was the fall of it. It's in the storm where we tend to get discouraged. We lash out at others. We make bad choices. Just remember that it was the Lord that let you into the situation. He has all power and all control. There's no reason to be upset because God's got his hand on everything. No, no reason to be upset at your neighbor. No reason to be upset at your family. No, nobody puts you there. God is taking care of you. Right. It's through the storms that we get stronger. It's through the storms that we see how things will get better in our lives. Different storms call for different actions. Some storms God wants us to make the first move. He's waiting for us to step out and make a change in our life. Some storms he wants us to be still and he will fight our battles for us. It is the storm that we enter. Every storm we enter is God's. It's not the devil's. Don't let the devil steal your joy. He's a liar and he's a, decei he's a deceiver and he wants the worst for you. Yeah. You know, we, we look at storms as the bad thing. But really, that's where, we get, that's where our strength lies. Don't let, the don't let the devil take something that the Lord meant for good. 
Don't let him take it and make it something bad because the Lord means it for good. If we go through those storms, that's strengthening us. That gets us to where we can witness to other people. That gets us to where our foundation is getting stronger, just like the oak tree. <clears throat> and when you find yourself in a storm, you tend to forget about the ones that are around you. You, you, you tend to forget about people really, well, you, you feel like you have nothing to lose once you get in that storm. Because you get to the point, it's like, man, it, uh, everything else is going wrong. I might as well try anything that I can. It gets to that point where you feel like you have nothing to lose. And people say that the most dangerous people are the people that have nothing to lose. If you have nothing to lose, then you normally don't have a worry if someone is going to judge you. You don't have a worry if what they think about you. You just do what you feel and you believe it will help you. This is why God gives us storms. We don't need to get to where we don't care about God. But if we get to the point to where we feel like, God, I don't care who's watching. I have nothing to lose. I'm going to worship you with all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all of my mind. God, I'm going to worship you no matter what because I know this storm is here. I have nothing to lose. God will help me through this storm. When you become, when you, when you, uh, when you get to this point, something when you feel like you have nothing to lose, you, be, you can become reckless, I guess you could say. I know the song, Reckless Love, that uh, Brother Mike Cannon really doesn't like, but we're, we're going to try to talk him into it. But, <laughs> but reckless love is basically when you get reckless, you, you don't care about what's going on around you. You're going to do what you're going to do. And I feel like if we get reckless for God, we'll see a lot of changes in our world today. If we just put down all the things that are around us, if we forget about the storm that we're in and we just do what God wants us to do, that's when God will do the greatest thing in our place. That's when God will touch this church. That's when God will touch the city of Humboldt. <clears throat> God puts us there so that we'll be sensitive to his will. That's, it's important that we have a strong foundation because, man, if you don't have, if you don't have a strong foundation, when the first storm comes, I mean, what's going to happen? You're out of here. Jesus puts them there to make us stronger. He doesn't put, them, put, them, put the storms there to make us leave. But it's our job before the storm comes. We know it's going to come. There's things that God's going to do to make sure that we're stronger. But before the storm comes, we've got to make sure that we make that foundation firm. We've got to make sure that everything's ready because I know there's a storm coming one day. <clears throat> and the reason why I say this is important, the story of Job comes to mind. Job, he got to the point to where, I mean, it was in one day. As soon as one messenger would come, another one would. And he would say, Job, uh, all your livestock is dead. Uh, Job, uh, all your kids are dead. It was just one thing after another. He continued to lose all of his valuables, all of his loved ones. And it got to the point his friends and even his wife was telling him to curse God, turn his back on God. I feel like in this point of Job's life, he felt like he had nothing to lose. He could have made a bad choice. He could have said, you know what, I'm going to listen to them because, God, you put me in a bad place. I'm in the midst of this storm. He had all the reason to. But he knew God still had his hand on his life. He knew no matter what, God's going to bless me. So instead of listening to all the people that were around him, he ignored them. He had nothing to lose. He went and he praised God with all of his might. I know he did. He went and gave God all the praise and said, you know what? I imagine him basically praying this. Lord, you can take everything from me, but you still are the, my maker. You're still the one who hung the stars in space. You're still the one who is there for me. I know. I know things had to be hard for Job, but he could still stop and praise God for everything. And, I mean... <clears throat> When you're not in the storm, you may be a little nervous about some things. You may not be open to certain things. Like, let's say if you're, if you're a shy person, you may not want to go pray with somebody. If you feel like it's time to go pray with somebody, you may not want to. But sometimes God puts us, puts us in those storms so that we're sensitive to his will. Peter is a prime example, like we was talking about earlier, of being reckless. For one moment, Peter had nothing to lose. He stepped out and became the only, like I said earlier, the only human to walk on water to get to walk to see Jesus like that. As soon as he looked around, he let the storm capture his attention. It said the boisterous, the boisterous wind, if I could say that word, 
<laughs> it said that the wind caught his attention. He took his eyes off Jesus. He let his storm surround him. He let the storm take his attention off the one who was helping him through it. He let the things around him distract him. His situation that he was walking through right then at that moment distracted him. He took his, he took his eyes off of Jesus. And he began to sink. I believe that we, <clears throat> I believe he had to have that moment before this verse. Later on in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, it says, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I think Peter had to go through some storms before Jesus would give him the keys. I think he had to go through some things before Jesus would let him. He had to go through a few storms to make sure that his foundation was set and his eyes were fixed on Jesus. Jesus had to make sure that he was giving the keys to the kingdom to a, a person who could handle it. Peter had to go through some serious storms. If the music musicians would come. So I have a question for you tonight. <clears throat> Is your foundation firm? Are your eyes fixed on Jesus? If they're not, then you're not going to fare well in the next storm that comes along. Meteorologists will say to have a plan in place before a storm comes. They always say, have a plan, have an emergency plan. If something happens, where are you going to go in your house? What are you going to do? You know, if, if it's something as simple as a storm at, at, on this earth, and we have to have a plan for it, don't you think we should have a plan for the spiritual storms in our life? We should have a plan for the storms that may come along. Paul and Silas praised God in jail. They didn't praise him because the jail shook. But they praised him in the midnight hour. They praised him before the jail shook. The jail shook because God seen their faith. He seen that no matter in the darkest of times, midnight's normally the darkest that you'll ever see it. In the darkest of times in their situation, God touched and answered. He seen their faith because they, in the midst of that horrible situation, they were still praising and giving God praise. When it seemed to be no hope, they praised God. I don't believe they waited till midnight as a part of their plan. I, I believe they, they had a plan that was just all along that, you know what, no matter what, no matter what gets thrown at us, we're still going to praise God. I mean, they were in a jail. They were shackled down. I mean, this is a long time ago. I'm per, I know they didn't have electricity and light bulbs. So it's dark in there. If anything, they may have a candle. But they waited till the darkest time, the worst point of their situation where they thought, man, if, if we don't get out of this, we're going to die. They started praising God. They believed that if we praise God, He will touch us in our situation. It was in the middle of the storm when Jesus said that the winds and rain would stop. If we could stand. It was in the middle of the storm when Peter stepped out and walked on the water. It was in the middle of the storm when Jesus healed the man's ear. It was in the middle of the storm when Job received his miracle and got more than what he had back from all the things that happened. It was in the middle of the storm that Paul and, Paul and Silas faced when they were freed from prison, when the jail shook and everything released off of them. What miracle does God have in the middle of your storm tonight? If you're, if you're facing a storm, if you're in the middle of a storm, what miracle does he have? Because God loves to do miracles in the middle of your storm. No matter what you're facing, what miracle does he have? Does he have salvation? Does he have healing? Maybe family to return to church. God has a plan. And it's time for us to get ready for that because it's time for us to get our miracle. Now, I don't want to single anyone out. So I'm going to pray, and then after I get done praying, I'm just going to do a simple altar call. If you feel that you need to come tonight, maybe to get the foundation firm and ready for the storm that may be coming, or if you're in the middle of the storm looking for that miracle that you can see that you can get out, God has a plan for you. Do you have a plan on how to get there?
Let's all pray. God, I thank you, Lord, for all that you do, Jesus. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for what you've given me tonight, Jesus. Lord, I pray, Lord, I delivered it, Lord, the way that you wanted it, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for all that you do, Lord. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you touch, Lord, hearts and minds, Jesus. Lord, I thank you, God, for all that you do, Lord. We praise your name, God. We thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said, if you want to have a firm foundation, if you want to come, I'm inviting you right now. If you feel like you're in the middle of the storm and you need a way out, you need a miracle to get you to that point, I'm inviting you to come right now. God has something for you tonight. All you have to do is step out and take it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm inviting you to Thank you.